Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Trieste and, and particularly here. Um, I'm not sure I remember what did I present last time I was here. Probably uh, the, the first part of this story. Um, but anyway, so the, 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 the focus of my presentation would be um, neuromuscular diseases. And um, uh, Geniton, uh, again, is, the, uh, is, is a non-profit organization and it has been created by the, uh, the French Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, which uh, today is called AFM Teleton. So it, it starts as a, as a charity focused on, uh, on muscle diseases. And although uh, in, in Geniton we address all kinds of diseases. And, uh, the, in fact, the most uh, advanced in terms of development that are already in the clinics are blood diseases, which will not be the focus of my uh, presentation today. Um, one of the major goals, if not the most important goal uh, of, of Geniton is, uh, is trying to treat um, neuromuscular diseases and muscular dystrophy in particular. So I'll give you uh, a sense of what, of what we do. Um, uh, in particular on, on two diseases. Um, I, I think I don't need too much of an introduction here. But anyway, uh, just to, uh, uh, to remind you that our goal is to transfer gene into this uh, tissue here, uh, which is the skeletal or the cardiac muscle. And, um, and of course, this is a, a very difficult uh, endeavor for, for, for a number of reasons. The first is that uh, the Muscle it accounts for most of our body mass, so it's an enormous target uh, that we need to reach. Uh, uh, second, we cannot use stem cells or things like that as, as we do when we uh, we treat uh, blood diseases by transplanting, repopulating stem cells. Here, we don't have repopulating stem cells. What we need to treat is the uh, uh, the the real thing, so the differentiated uh, muscle tissue. Um, and of course, the, um, the the mass means that we need enormous amounts of uh, vectors and of products to target these issues. Um, and it's not obvious how to target the tissue with the structure that, as you know, is made uh, essentially of fibers. But these fibers are arranged and packed uh, and, and, and packaged at the end in very large uh, muscles and need to be. Uh, transduced uh, uh, if we want to use gene therapy uh, there. And, um, and to transduce, we need vectors that can access uh, the muscle through the blood circulation with the right tropism, with the right uh, dose. Uh, and, uh, and anyway, this, this, this whole thing is, is of course, it's a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult target. And, and to do this, and here, uh, obviously, I don't need an introduction, so I will go very rapidly. Uh, what we use is AAVs. And uh, AAV, as you know, uh, is, a, is, a, is a part of a virus uh, as a genome, which is relatively small, which, uh, of course, uh, is a constraint for uh, a number of uh, uh, targets, in particular for muscular dystrophy. Um, and um, the beauty of the of these vectors is that it comes in uh, uh, in, in many different uh, flavors, many different serotypes, and these serotypes are very different tropism and very different tropism in very different species. Uh, but essentially, it's a very flexible and it's a very convenient uh, uh, platform to 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 build vectors. And uh, again, well, this, we we can skip all this. Uh, but practically, what we do uh, is we insert genes into a system uh, which is uh, completely devoid of all the, 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 the viral genes. Um, we, uh, we produce this uh, AAV with different systems. Uh, I will show you uh, uh, data obtained in, in um, most of the cases with uh, AAV producing in the system that it's baculovirus, so we use a virus to produce another virus. Uh, and just to give you a, a, a brief uh, a summary of what the system is, this is uh, these are two different baculoviruses that are um, uh, 
uh, reproduced in, uh, in SF9 cells. These are insect cells. And essentially, one baculovirus contains uh, the, the rep and cap uh, genes, and the other baculovirus contains uh, the, the vector with our transgene. Uh, these two viruses uh, co-infect the cells, uh, and insect cells produce uh, something that is pretty close to the virus that is, although not identical, to the virus that's produced by um, human cells, 293, like everybody uh, does uh, currently in the lab. Uh, and uh, the, the interest of this system is that this, it can be uh, uh, scaled up, uh, up to uh, uh, production into bioreactors, which are sort of state of the art in the industry. These are machines that are produced uh, uh, for, for all kinds of uh, cell uh, culture applications. And, uh, and uh, you can adapt your uh, baculovirus system to, to work into these uh, uh, bioreactors and produce uh, up in, in this particular system that you see here up to 400 liters of uh, uh, supernatant uh, by using these 200 liters uh, bioreactors working in tandem with a, with a single pilot unit. And, uh, and this is purified with, uh, with the downstream process that you need to adapt to the serotype, of course. Um, and what we use is based on uh, immune affinity chromatography with uh, uh, resins that uh, uh, and antibody lab, uh, antibodies developed specifically for, for certain serotypes. I will show you uh, AV8 for mo most of my presentation. And, uh, and a series of steps that at the end, uh, uh, starting from 400 liters, you end up with 400 milliliters uh, of uh, vectors uh, uh, and uh, with a productivity that it's between 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 16 uh, vector genomes total per uh, production. Um, the, I will tell you um, about two diseases. I will tell you two stories. One is um, First one is a, um, is a rare disease that very few people know. Uh, it's called myotubular myopathy. It's um, a next linked uh, uh, disease. Uh, and the second would be Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so M MTM, uh, myotubular myopathy is caused, uh, uh, it's, it's a myopathy, it's not a muscular dystrophy. So it's caused by, um, absence of uh, a lipid phosphatase produced by a gene that is called MTM1, which is on, on the X chromosome. Um, and it's a very severe uh, disease. Um, it's uh, the, the consequences of not having this uh, phosphatase uh, is, uh, is, is catastrophic metabolic uh, consequence for the muscle fiber. And, and the result is this. Muscle fibers remain very small. They don't grow. They have uh, their central nuclei. Uh, and, and essentially don't work. Uh, so uh, these patients, uh, half of the patients die in the first uh, uh, year of life. They have all complete failure in, in any musculature. Uh, strangely enough, not really in the heart. Uh, but they have, uh, of course, the skeletal muscular is severely affected. They, uh, they have respiratory failure, which is the first cause of death. Uh, and they need to be uh, under assisted ventilation after the first months of life. So this is a terrible disease. Um, and don't, patients that survive, uh, as it is obvious from this uh, picture, don't live a, a very uh, happy life. Uh, and they depend on this machine that is uh, under the wheelchair for uh, assisted ventilation. There is no cure, of course, for this disease. Uh, and the defect is just this gene. This gene uh, is uh, small enough to be uh, put into uh, um, an AAV vector. And uh, many years ago, uh, Anna Bouchbelo, a very talented uh, postdoc at the time, she was working in Strasbourg and she moved uh, uh, Geneton uh, six years ago. She developed uh, um, the classical knockout model of the disease. So it's a mouse uh, in which uh, uh, the, the the gene has been uh, knocked out completely, so it's a null uh, model. And uh, this uh, model reproduces very well uh, the disease uh, at the level of histology, this is the typical picture, and also at the level of uh, pathology, uh, mice, uh, knockout mice, uh, die uh, 
uh, within the first couple of months of life. Um, and um, at the time, uh, what uh, Anna showed is that if you uh, put the MTM gene under the control of a muscle-specific promoter, this is Desmin, uh, in uh, an AV8, uh, and you inject uh, this uh, vector in the tail, you rescue 100% uh, of the animals uh, completely, uh, and not only, but the, the growth of this animal uh, is actually almost normal. This is the, the these are the knockout mouse. This is the weight. Uh, wild type are in uh, black, and uh, and the knockout uh, treated knockout is is in purple. Uh, they are a little smaller than normal animals, but they essentially live uh, an almost normal uh, lifespan, and uh, and they uh, and they are almost completely uh, rescued in their pathology. So this was interesting, of course. Um, um, the, the second important thing that uh, Anna showed was that, um, of course, in, in most of these uh, uh, models, you, you treat the animal very early. So you essentially prevent the disease from developing more than treating a disease. So, uh, but this is uh, the model, although severe, is, uh, is, is sufficient. Uh, to ask the question, what happens if we treat animals that are already affected by the disease? Can we rescue them? And, and so the, what uh, Anna did was uh, uh, injecting animals at three weeks or early before, let's say, the, uh, um, uh, the, before the establishment of, uh, of the clinical uh, symptoms of the pathology, or two weeks uh, after that, uh, so the late injection, and two weeks uh, after uh, uh, at five weeks after birth, 25% uh, uh, of the animals are already died, and those that, uh, uh, that are uh, still alive are uh, affected by uh, the disease. It's, it's, it's visible. So what happens if we treat, um, well, early treatment, you have seen it before. Late treatment, can we rescue all these animals that are still alive? Yeah, and the answer is yes. 100% of the surviving animals can be uh, rescued by uh, injection, by late injection. And again, they start growing uh, uh, almost normally, and they uh, approach the uh, normal growth curve for this animal. So uh, with the limit of this uh, uh, small animal model, uh, the evidence was that not only the disease can be prevented, but it can also be treated when the animal is already affected. And uh, the histology uh, shows that uh, the rescue, both uh, at five weeks and uh, in three weeks uh, uh, treatment, uh, uh, the, the, the histology and, and, uh, and the uh, phenotype of the muscle uh, can be completely rescued. Um, these are functional evaluations, which are uh, relatively easy to do in animals. So you can study uh, the, the, the motility, so the, the, the activity of these animals uh, by using an actimeter, which is essentially camera that monitors the, uh, the, the movement at night of the animals in the cage. And uh, again, uh, uh, you, you can show that uh, anim affected animals, uh, of course, have uh, reduced uh, uh, activity and, and treated animals to rescue uh, the activity. Not only, but you can study isolated muscle and, uh, and ask the question of the uh, specific force, so the force that uh, you, can, uh, you can measure. Uh, in vitro, uh, after sacrifice by uh, isolated muscles, and essentially again uh, the uh, decrease of force that you observe is uh, is rescued in animal treated at, at uh, uh, early or late treatment, and although uh, reduced with respect to uh, controls, it's still uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, rescued. By the uh, AAV injection. So that's the animal model. Uh, uh, interesting. Uh, what was also interesting is that we, uh, we found uh, evidence of toxicity in, this, uh, in these animals, by, particularly by uh, using high doses, um, that was were very difficult to, to, to understand. And then the reason of this toxicity, and essentially, this, this is the dose. It's, it's, a, it's a very significant dose. Uh, um, we are discussing um, doses that are enormous for, for, for patients, 10 to the 14 vector genome per kilogram. Uh, what we observed in this uh, model are focal lesions, essentially fibrosis, uh, in, in the majority of the treated mice at six months. Uh, as you know, mice survive very well this kind of injuries. You don't 
don't really see any symptoms of this, but uh, at uh, the pathological uh, examination, these are uh, evident. Um, with inflammatory infiltrates, uh, fibrosis, and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, what, what is the cause of this? Of course, all the controls don't develop this. So it's not the serotype, it's not the AAV, it's not, it's not the, um, the nothing. All the controls don't develop this. The only animals that develop this type of uh, effect are those that uh, express uh, MTM1. And um, in, uh, an elegant experiment that uh, Anna did uh, uh, to show, both to formally prove that it is the protein expression that causes the problem, and to actually find, to find, uh, try to find a way to solve this problem, uh, was to uh, de uh, reduce uh, expression of MTM1 in the heart, but not in the skeletal muscle, by putting the uh, target sequence for uh, microRNA, this uh, 208A, uh, which is a microRNA which is expressed uh, specifically in the heart, with the idea of detargeting the heart uh, overexpression um, in these animals and, 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 and see the, the results. So uh, a series of vectors have been built with one, two, or four uh, sequences uh, uh, targeted by this uh, microRNA, and then the result was pretty spectacular because um, if, if you look at this uh, graph here, this is a complex slide, but, um, uh, but essentially these are different muscles, tibialis anterior, quadriceps, triceps. And uh, what, what you see here, uh, this is uh, uh, protein levels um, in, uh, in, in the muscle. Uh, of course, in the one is, uh, let's say it's, it's the normal level. Uh, when you uh, overdose um, these animals, uh, you express uh, high level of uh, uh, myotubulary, uh, but levels that are five, six fold the normal level, so nothing dramatic. In the heart, you, are, uh, you reach levels that are 400, 500, 600, the normal level. So the overexpression in the heart is, is very dramatic. It's not the vector copy number, it's the Desmond promoter that causes this. Um, but when we use uh, the microRNA sequences, this, everything that you see in yellow here is the vector with the, with the detargeting sequence. Um, nothing happens in the, in the skeletal muscle, so the expression is the same compared to a non-targeted vector. So this is the, uh, the vector, Desmin MTM1. This is Desmin MTM1 with the, with the microRNA uh, target sequence. Nothing in the skeletal muscle, but in the heart, the expression drops down to uh, below normal level. So you completely abolish the overexpression of uh, myotubulary in the heart by using this sequence, and the result is that the uh, cardiac uh, uh, pathology uh, doesn't appear anymore. So this is the formal proof that the overexpression of the protein is causing this, uh, uh, this, uh, this effect, which is not an immune effect. It's not mediated by lymphocyte, but it's mediated by inflammatory infiltrates that cause scars in the heart. And somehow, this is induced by excessive expression of uh, uh, the protein. Um, so good and bad things here. Uh, the, the bad thing is that we can predict that uh, we may have a toxic effect also in patients. The good thing is that maybe we can use a vector like this in, in a, in for the patients. Uh, but as you will see, um, this is one of the cases in which uh, mice lie. And uh, when we moved to a different models, we did not find this type of uh, uh, character, despite of overexpression in the mouse. And we did not find the same kind of pathology. And, and, uh, and these other models in which we studied um, uh, the, the gene therapy for this disease is, is, is a dog model, which is a pretty interesting uh, story in itself. So this is a natural mutation. It's a, it, it's a dog that carries a missense mutation in exon 7. So this is not a null mutation, but it's uh, the, 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 the residual uh, matriburin proteins are below 1%. So it's, it's a very uh, severe uh, lack of uh, uh, loss of function mutation, but with the, with the residual protein. Um, and, uh, and the animal is affected, uh, is affected with a pathology that uh, uh, reminds uh, uh, strongly of, uh, of the human pathology. And the reason why this, this, is, this story is, is very interesting is that this animal was found serendipitously in a factory in Canada by this woman here, whose name is Alison Frace. And uh, this is a mother of a child 
with, uh, with, uh, uh, with myotubular myopathy, that somehow thought that that dog looked like his, her son. And um, she essentially smuggled this dog into the United States and then went to uh, the laboratories of Alan Beck at Harvard, who uh, sequenced the, uh, the gene and found the mutation, surprisingly enough. So um, this dog started a colony. And uh, here you see Casey Childers at the University of Washington in Seattle that uh, with, with proudly shows his uh, family here. Um, and uh, from dog zero, uh, he established essentially a colony with this uh, uh, disease that uh, uh, now uh, we can use uh, in, in collaboration uh, to uh, study uh, the efficacy and uh, the safety of uh, uh, this therapy uh, in the dog model. Uh, what we use here is, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, it's a vector that carries uh, this time the uh, canine MTM sequence, but the, the promoter is the same. And this is produced uh, uh, with the baculovirus systems. This is the uh, immune affinity column uh, at 200 liters uh, in, uh, in, in bioreactors and, uh, and used to treat the, the dogs. You need a lot of vector to treat these animals that are several kilograms. And we're not talking about mice here. And, um, I will, I will make this story short because it's, it's a long story. But anyway, um, this started with the intramuscular injection just to prove the principle. And then we went to inter, in intravenous injection of AV. Again, this is an AV8. The, the work is published, so I go very, very rapidly. But uh, very rapidly, uh, I can show you that in red uh, is the non-treated animal. Uh, the wild type is in black. In purple are the treated animal. This is, this is a single injection at the dose uh, of uh, uh, 3 times 10 to the 13 uh, vector genome per kilogram. And uh, what you see here, this is the, the strength of, of, uh, of, the, um, of the dog's uh, limbs that can be measured um, relatively easily. Um, and um, again, uh, this is the baseline. These are six weeks after treatment, 14 weeks after treatment. And you see that the, 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 the strength curve of the treated animal tends to approach, and finally, uh, is, is not uh, statistically significant, uh, the, the strength of, an, uh, of a wild type animal, uh, whereas the uh, non treated animals uh, essentially uh, become very weak and, and have, need to be uh, put down because they cannot be maintained uh, more than four months. Um, the important thing is this. In, in, in dogs, you can study respiratory um, function. And this is the respiratory function of a wild-type animal, eight weeks, 14 weeks, one year. This is the uh, peak inspiratory flow that you can measure in, in the animal. Uh, and of course, it tends to uh, increase with, uh, with age, with size. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, the non-treated animals that you cannot measure uh, after a certain time point. And these are the animals that have been treated that, of course, survive, uh, but uh, essentially recover 100% of the respiratory function. So this is a complete treatment for the respiratory part uh, uh, of the uh, disease in these uh, animals. And the interesting thing was that um, we didn't find any, any heart uh, problem in this animal. This is uh, one year after treatment. The heart is completely normal. And when we measured uh, vector copy number and protein expression in this, uh, in dogs, we found uh, a completely different uh, picture. Uh, the, the tropism of AV8 for, for the heart uh, of, the, of a dog and of a primate is not the same uh, uh, that compared to, 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 a, to a mouse. And, um, and uh, the, the Desmin promoter does not give that kind of over enormous overexpression that we have observed in the mouse. Uh, same in the primates. Uh, the, the tox uh, study that uh, is, is going on now shows that also in primates, we, we don't have any, any issue at all. So um, this is just to show you uh, the effect of the, of the therapy, which is more than any, any, any graph. These are animals affected by the disease, and uh, as you see, they, 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 they're very weak animals. They have difficulty to move, and uh, as I said, they had to be sacrificed uh, uh, three months. Uh, here, it, it's in English, but it's 
dubbed in, in French for obvious reasons. And here the, uh, they show that the animals have no strength, essentially. They have no reflex. Um, and they are really very sick. This is one of the treated animals. Um, and it's pretty obvious that it's different from the other one. <clears throat> and uh, essentially, these animals uh, survive uh, at long time. Um, they, some of these animals have been sacrificed after one year to study them. So this is pretty strong uh, uh, from that point of view. Uh, it has normal reflexes. As I said, they have a normal respiratory function. One of these dogs is now in the house of, the, of, of Casey. It's his pet uh, dog. Uh, and, um, and the interesting thing is that uh, uh, after uh, uh, when they uh, reach sexual maturity, they start developing a normal interest for their uh, females, uh, um, litter mates. So uh, actually, they contribute to, to the colony at this point. So they, they're completely normal animals. So this was a pretty spectacular effect. Uh, we, we published part of this story uh, in 2014. Well, this is just uh, the summary of what I showed. But of course, we, we went on with the study. And uh, the idea is to translate this into a, into a clinical trial. So uh, we started uh, those finding studies uh, more accurately. These are very expensive studies, as you may guess, because they're all done with the dogs in the dog model. Um, fortunately, uh, now there is a biotech that pays for, for all this, otherwise it wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been possible. Uh, so this is the um, three different doses, just to show that this is dose dependent. So a dose around 5 times 10 to the 12 vector genome per kilogram is partially effective. This is just survival. Uh, these are uh, non-treated uh, animals treated at low dose. Uh, and when we reach uh, uh, the level of 10 to the 13, we essentially rescued all the animals. And, uh, and increasing the dose after that uh, is not uh, uh, particularly uh, useful. This is almost approaching 10 to the 14 uh, vector genomes per kilogram, which is essentially almost one lot per, per, per patient, the projected dose. Uh, this, I, I thought that this is interesting for this audience. Um, this is the biodistribution uh, study of the um, uh, vector copy number. So where the vector goes into a large animal. And again, you see in the three colors, the low, the intermediate, and the high dose. Uh, and these are uh, vector genome per diploid genome. And these are all kinds of different muscle. These two are the heart, right and left ventricle. This is the diaphragm. Uh, these are the organs, liver, lung, bladder, stomach. So the vector goes as expected. This is an AV8 pretty much everywhere. And, and this is dose dependent. But it reaches all uh, kinds of muscles. Uh, it's interesting to note that in the, heart, the heart is transduced very well, which is a good news, but not any better than any other uh, skeletal muscle. And this is really different with respect to, uh, to the mouse model, in which the heart is transduced 10 times more. Um, when you look at protein, this is a muscle-specific um, uh, uh, promoter. So you, you see those dependent uh, uh, increase uh, of protein expression analyzed by Western blot. One is, uh, is, is the normal level. Um, and you see that l the low dose is really not effective in terms of protein expression. The intermediate, the clinically effective dose, uh, it reaches uh, about 50% of the normal level of protein in all uh, the muscles um, uh, in, and a little more in, in the heart. So it's, it's completely uh, uh, normalized in the heart. It's not more. But again, it's two, three times more than the normal level of expression, not 600 times more. And of course, in the other organs, it's only traces because the, the promoter is restricted. So this allows us to predict the uh, clinical dose and to predict it in a, in a, in a very relevant uh, large animal model of the disease. Um, and uh, I, I just want to show you this last movie because it's pretty spectacular. I, I almost didn't believe when, when, when I saw it. Um, and this is uh, the same experiment that I showed you before in the mouse. So can, can we rescue a severely affected animal? Um, or the effect is visible only when we treat uh, animals early. And, uh, and this uh, dog uh, 
is a dog that the vet veterinary uh, wanted to uh, put down because it was, was really at the limit of the uh, ethically reasonable uh, lifespan for, a, for an animal like this. And, uh, and, and you can see this is an extremely weak animal. It fatigues uh, and almost it just really doesn't, doesn't want to get around. And uh, it, it's, it, well, it's actually terrible to, to look at this animal. Um, but this animal was injected uh, with the dog. So th that animal, that particular animal, and um, to, to our surprise, the, the effect already at two weeks was, was sufficient to convince the veterinary uh, to not to sacrifice this animal. Um, this is two weeks after infusion. Um, and, and this is a month after infusion. And, and, and the animal is completely rescued. Although the, it moves in a pretty strange way with a sort of, uh, it, it, looks, it moves like a rabbit more than like, than like a dog. But, but it, you know, 10% uh, of this in a patient would be a sort of a miraculous cure. So oh, everything looks pretty uh, promising in these animals. Uh, we're moving this, uh, uh, we, we are at the level of uh, toxicology now, and uh, we're moving this into a clinical trial. Would be, this will be a clinical trial, uh, a multinational, which most probably would start in the United States and not in France for uh, practical reasons. Um, one of which is that uh, this company here, it's called Odentes Therapeutics, it's, uh, it's a biotech based in, uh, in, in California, I was so convinced about, after looking at the first uh, dogs that uh, decided to license and to pay for the, uh, the entire uh, trial. And again, uh, here uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the group of uh, Anna uh, at uh, Geneton that did uh, fantastic work with everything. And this is the group of Casey Childers uh, in Seattle that uh, uh, was uh, uh, fundamental uh, to uh, study the, um, the animal models of the disease. So what I showed you is that uh, a single injection of uh, an AV8 uh, coding for the mitoburin gene um, can rescue uh, all the symptoms of this disease uh, in a small and in a large animal model. Now, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is not a dystrophy. So the muscle tissue is not, doesn't degenerate. Um, it's essentially spared by the disease for, for, for years and can be rescued. Um, the second important thing is that the, the, the phosphatase is a soluble uh, uh, product. It diffuses in the muscle. And uh, we already know from the clinical data that 10% uh, of the normal level of mitubularin are sufficient to have a, a essentially an almost complete uh, rescue of the pathology. So the ta the, really the target is not too high. The bar is not high in this disease. Um, we need to express uh, uh, more than 10% of the normal levels in, uh, in the muscle uh, fibers and, uh, and we can hope uh, to essentially treat the pathology. Um, a very difficult uh, uh, scenario, and I will take my uh, last 10-15 uh, minutes to, to, to go through it, is, is the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Why is it? Because this is a, a dystrophy. So the, the, the pathology in this case is, is, uh, is degeneration. Uh, with time, um, muscle is replaced by uh, scar tissue and fat, and when you don't have any muscle anymore, you have nothing to treat. So here, the bar is much higher, uh, it will be most likely impossible to rescue a patient that is in a wheelchair, um, and um, e even less so uh, with patients in more advanced stages of the, the diseases, we will need to treat patients early. And of course, as you may, uh, as you may imagine, um, you, you don't start clinical trials by, by treating kids. So, uh, this will be a very long road uh, that will inevitably start from partial correction of, uh, of patients with, uh, uh, with established uh, disease uh, to move progressively into uh, younger patients. But this will be a very, very long story. And, and the, the, the second reason why this is, would be very difficult is that the protein here is this one. As you know, it's dystrophin. It's a structure of protein, and it's an enormous protein. It's a, it's a 400 kilodalton protein with a cDNA um, that is more than 14 kb. It's completely impossible to put this uh, uh, cDNA encoding for the full length protein in any of the vectors that we know, and certainly not in an AAV. So, what can we do? Um, 
three years ago, uh, after just after I, uh, I, I started working with Janet, um, uh, this uh, person here, uh, whose name is George Dixon, is he, he works on muscular dystrophy since he was a child, probably, um, at the Royal Holloway Hospital in London. And he has been playing with, uh, with this construct, as many other people in the field, uh, that are called mini dystrophy, micro dystrophy. So essentially, with reduced version of the, of the protein, this is the, the structure of the dystrophy protein with, uh, uh, that, I uh, just remind you, uh, established the bridges between the uh, contractile fiber between the actin and essentially this uh, transmembrane uh, uh, complex here, and it's essential for the structural integrity of the of the muscle fiber and for the uh, coupling with the, the, for the neuromuscular junction. So, um, and this protein has several functional domains. Most importantly, the N terminal and the and the carboxy terminal, which binds to the two extremes of the of the bridge. Uh, and then uh, a number of domains, these are protein domains, are not exons, um, that there are more than 70 exons in this, in this gene. These are protein domains that, that are essentially repeats uh, um, and, uh, and other hinges region, which are here in yellow, and other, other domains that uh, do end loss binding or things like that. So um, essentially, many, many years of investigation, several investigators, including uh, George, have developed very much reduced version of the protein, in which all this filamentous uh, part of the protein has been reduced to a minimum. This is partially based on uh, natural mutations that are much less severe than Duchenne muscular dystrophy, that uh, have, uh, which patients have large deletions of this uh, part of the gene. And uh, this is small enough, this uh, particular one, that uh, R4, R, uh, repeat 4, repeat 23, to be uh, put into, uh, into an AV vector under the control of a synthetic promoter, which is a strong muscle-specific uh, promoter. Um, and the, the size of all this is less than 5 uh, kb. So it, it can be packaged into an AV, and uh, we package it into an AV uh, uh, two backbone and eight uh, two genome and eight uh, serotype, um, and uh, the question is, uh, can we uh, uh, rescue any uh, sign of the pathology by using a small gene like this? Transgenic animal data shows that animal uh, in, the, in the mouse model of the disease, uh, transgenic animals carrying this gene instead of the normal one uh, are less functional than normal than uh, than uh, affected animals but uh, but not completely normal but anyway this protein is functional and can uh, can provide uh, uh, most of the uh, of the dystrophin function in the mouse and this is a, a, a study that I, I won't uh, explain uh, published study in the MDX mouse model of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy which shows that uh, systemic injection of uh, an AV um, uh, in, in the mouse uh, rescues the muscle turnover, uh, uh, reduces the loss of muscle force, uh, and a number of physiological parameters like resistance to eccentric contraction and things like that. So the gene is functional, can rescue in the mouse model, which is not particularly severe, by the way, uh, the disease. And uh, um, our goal was to move this into a large animal model again. And the large animal model, which is very well known in the field, is the GRMD, which means the Golden Retriever Muscular Dystrophy. Again, these are animals that carry a natural mutation um, and, um, and, and, and develop a, a, a phenotype which is similar to the human phenotype and much more severe than the, than the mouse phenotype. And this is the, uh, the team that in Nantes, uh, it's uh, an issue that's called Atlantic Gene Therapies, which, as you can see by the logos, is funded by the same um, foundation. So this is our sister uh, organization. This is Caroline Neguiner, who is the, 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 the driver of everything I'm going to show you. Uh, they have, they work with this mouse, with this uh, dog colony, and, uh, and they help us in establishing um, uh, a reasonable basis for, for a clinical investigation in this field. And um, uh, we did a number of uh, experiments, and I'm not sure I will have the time to go into too much detail with this, but essentially we started with a sort of um, reduced version of what we would like to do in patients, which was uh, administration by isolated limb perfusion. So the, the goal here was to 
treat one limb of the dog and see uh, the difference um, by using relatively low doses of, uh, of uh, factor, which is not very easy to produce. As you may guess, again, this is an AV8. And in this model, I will show you some data with the isolated limb perfusion and then more recent data that we obtained with the systemic injection, so the, the, the entire animal. Uh, this uh, model, uh, by the way, was, was, very, was very useful. So essentially, you put a tourniquet uh, in, the, in, the, in the upper limb of the animal, you inject with the pump here, you release the tourniquet after 10-15 uh, minutes, and most of the vector goes into one limb. Most, but not all. So then when you release the tourniquet, it tends to diffuse. So depending on the dose, uh, you, you, you can have. The, the result is that um, if you, uh, if in the same dog, you compare dystrophy in expression, control limb and injected limb, the difference is obvious. So in the injected limb, uh, you can uh, relatively easily reach more than 50% of, uh, of the, exp the fibers expressing the microdystrophy in uh, different, uh, different muscles. Um, and uh, in, in this muscle, you can study a number of parameters. And for instance, the expression of something that is called uh, developmental myosin heavy chain, which is uh, something that the muscle express uh, in, the, in, in the fetus, but then it's turned off in the adult life, but it's turned on again when the muscle regenerates continuously as a result of the degeneration induced by the pathology. This is untreated uh, um, uh, limb in which uh, less than 1% of this positive fibers, 20% of the fibers express this um, marker. And in the treated animals with 80% of this positive fibers, 2% of those. So this marker uh, obviously correlates with restoration of the dystrophin expression. Fibrosis correlates with the restoration of uh, dystrophin expression, which is an important uh, sign, uh, an important part of the pathology. And you can study uh, uh, with a number of non-invasive uh, 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 imaging, which will be particularly useful uh, when we translate this to patients. For instance, uh, uh, proton uh, NMR, uh, which uh, distinguishes uh, very well the healthy muscle tissue that you see here. These are two limbs of a wild-type dog from fat tissue that accumulates in the, in the un, untreated dog. So the white is the bad part, and the dark is the good part. And essentially, in, uh, in the treated limbs of these animals, by NMR, uh, we can show that uh, not only we can express uh, microdystrophy in the fibers, but the fat accumulation is severely reduced. So this is all good, because it also uh, allows us to uh, establish uh, outcome measures that would be uh, useful uh, to follow a clinical trial. And, uh, and, and of course, in these animals, uh, you can also measure force. So the animal is sedated. Um, uh, the, the, the limb is strapped to this uh, uh, plate. And uh, you induce, uh, by an electric pulse, muscle contraction. And you can measure the force of this muscle contraction. Uh, in, the, in the treated and untreated limb, and then the, the bottom line is that, uh, um, and this is an important piece of uh, data, um, that animals in which you have less than 10% of the fibers expressing dystrophin lose muscle strength with time. Animal with, uh, uh, with, with between 10 and 40% of uh, microdystrophin expression is essentially stabilized. If you can uh, exceed 40% of protein expression, force actually increases. Uh, and, um, and, and this is uh, it's an important uh, uh, point because it shows that, again, this is not uh, uh, an enzyme. This is a structure protein. And unless you can uh, uh, save at least uh, half uh, of the fibers, the pathology continues to, to persist. So the, the non-expressing fibers continue to degenerate. Uh, regeneration is induced. Uh, fat and scar tissue are established. And, uh, and with, with time, you tend to lose the AAV just because the fibers regenerate. And you lose the, and you lose the, uh, the vector and the gene expression. So again, here the bar is extremely high. Not only you have to express high levels of uh, proteins, but you have to express it in the uh, beyond a certain threshold. Otherwise, this is not going to be effective. Um, well, these are clinical outcome measures, but we can skip this. So uh, for the sake of time, uh, I will briefly show the results of the more uh, 
recent analysis that we did uh, uh, in a number of dogs treated systemically. So this time the goal is to uh, treat the entire animal and to uh, analyze the, uh, the, the outcome of this. Um, here you see the first uh, three dogs that we injected, but we have many more and I will show you uh, the, the data. So systemic injection is just as effective, uh, except that the dose that you need to inject uh, is, uh, is, is, is higher. Uh, so you see here uh, again uh, in uh, right limb, left limb, um, different muscles, uh, the, uh, the, the level of uh, fibers that are corrected. So the brown is the uh, protein expression and you see that depending on the muscle um, you can correct uh, between 40 and uh, 60 uh, percent of the fibers. Again this is dose dependent as you will see in a second. This is the most important part. So this is the clinical score. Uh, clinical score is something that the pathologists and the veterinary in the, in the unit, they know this model uh, very, very well. They, they score for a number of things and they compound, they have, this is a compound score that includes, that includes mobility, respiratory function, uh, ability to perform exercise, and, and things like that. 100% uh, is a normal animal, 0% is a dead animal, and this is the, uh, the, the untreated, the control animals. And you see that the clinical score drops pretty rapidly and pretty dramatically in these animals, with, although with exceptions, which is interesting. There are some animals that, uh, that be behave better than, 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 than the majority, but essentially between six months and one year, all these animals need to be uh, put down. Um, with the exception of this long-term survivor. Now, what happens if we, uh, when, when we uh, inject the, the vector? Again, in green, uh, you have a sort of a low dose, uh, where low here, this time, is 10 to the 13 vector genome per kilogram. And in blue, it's what we call high dose, which is 10 to the 14, so uh, five times more vector genomes per kilogram. The low dose is, is not effective. It's very difficult to distinguish these animals from the untreated ones. Uh, the high dose is a different story. So uh, some animals really do very well. Um, but the majority of these animals are statistically uh, significant. Uh, they have, there is a statistically significant difference between these animals and this if you don't consider this outlier. If you consider this outlier, we need probably under dogs to, to show this. But it's pretty obvious what is the difference. And you will see, uh, and these are animals that we are keeping uh, long term. And, uh, and the, the difference is, would be pretty obvious when, we, when, when I show you again this movie. Um, this is a, a six month old untreated animal. Um, they are much better than MTM dogs, but again, they, they're very weak and uh, they cannot jump this barrier and reach the toy or the food on the other side. This is a more sophisticated barrier, as you see, uh, that the animal can sort of cross, but, 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 but really not too much. Um, this is a seven-old uh, GMD dog treated with the high dose, so with the therapeutic uh, dose. And, uh, and I think it's obvious that it behaves better and it can jump. Um, untreated and treated, uh, seen at, uh, at the same time. This is the untreated, this is the treated. Uh, competition for the ball is unfair. Uh, this animal uh, obviously can run. The other one can wag the tail, but not really do much more than that. Um, here you see um, uh, two dogs um, uh, treated. Uh, and uh, just to show that uh, it's not one dog. Uh, that the that, uh, that, that does this. Um, and this is the exercise that no GRMD dog can do, which is standing on the, on the, on the hind limbs. Uh, and because it requires an enormous force uh, for, for an animal. Um, these are the animals treated with the uh, low dose. Uh, and as I said, it's difficult to distinguish this animal from untreated. Essentially, they are indistinguishable. And so the conclusion is that there is a threshold uh, the, re the response is not linear, and again, we believe that it's the number of uh, fibers corrected that makes the difference. You need to uh, reach a certain do uh, dose to, to be effective. This, uh, the dogs are, you know, are growing up, and this is our champion here, who 
is really doing very well. Uh, this is another one, uh, not as good as the first one, but still behaving. Um, nine more hole treated with uh, the high dose. This dog uh, essentially broke a bone accidentally by exiting the cage, but that was uh, repaired pretty well. And, uh, and, you, and you can see uh, he, he can stand on the hind limb and can do this exercise, which is uh, an important component of the clinical score. When a dog can jump like this, it's obviously different from the untreated control. This is a, a, essentially an athlete and is doing this difficult exercise of finding this very important piece of cloth. That I don't know why they like it very much, so much. Anyway, this shows that, uh, that there is a very significant efficacy of this treatment. As I said, this correlates. Uh, the reason why we have a threshold is, is, is shown here. These are the animals treated with the low, and these are the animals treated with the high dose. And this is the number of dystrophin positive fibers three months after injection. And as you see here, you have over 50% uh, uh, in, in all the animals consistently. And here, it, it's really obvious that uh, this is not effective. This is, that doesn't correct enough. Um, this is the, the long-term uh, uh, follow-up. We are for 14 months here, but the, the animals, the two, two of the animals are uh, two years now after treatment. And, uh, and as you can see, it, 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 this is stable, it persists. So if we can reach, again, a certain uh, level of, uh, of, uh, of correction, so a certain number of fibers that are corrected, this persists with time. And this is not the case with animal treated at the lower dose. Still not a dose finding study, uh, but clearly shows that we will have to inject into patients gigantic dose of vectors, which of course pose a lot of problems in terms of establishing uh, safety, not only efficacy. Um, producing doses like this would be a challenge in itself. Uh, I will conclude because I have uh, no more time, but just to, uh, just with one brief point which is important, which is immune response. Uh, of course, all the animals uh, develop immune response against the capsid, that's pretty much uh, obvious. You cannot re-administer animals and you will not re-administer patients. But the real question that you can ask in these animals uh, is the protein, which is non-natural protein, raising an immune response. And, uh, and the result is encouraging because most of the animals we did not see antibody uh, response against the protein except these two that anyway developed a, a, a transient uh, response. So a transient elevation in antibodies against protein detected by uh, Western blot in the serum, but that disappeared with time. Um, and not a, no whatsoever uh, cytotoxic immune response measured by Elispot. Uh, or by uh, other uh, uh, systems. I really don't have the time to show you all the data. So, but the, the, the results of this very long study, it's three years now that uh, we are playing with these animals, show um, obvious evidence of efficacy uh, at the reasonably long time point, uh, and of safety in terms of, uh, in the dogs at least, the therapy is tolerated, and uh, uh, besides the uh, uh, serum immune response uh, against the capsid, there is nothing else that uh, uh, make us worry in terms of clinical translation. Uh, this is the result, and this let just me uh, acknowledge again. This is an enormous group of people, so more than 100 people working on, on this project in the different uh, uh, laboratories. This is uh, George Dixon in London. This is Philippe Poulier. Uh, in Nantes, where uh, Caroline Le Guinea works, that they did all the work on the animal studies. This is our clinical group that are doing, are putting together the outcome measures, the imaging, uh, the metabolic uh, studies, uh, the immunology, and that, and this is the, uh, the the people at Geneton that did everything else, uh, from vector constructions to um, microbiology, physiology, histology, and everything else. Uh, I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope the next time I come here, I will come with some clinical data, at least for the MTM that should be in patients early next year. Uh, for for dystrophin, I think it will take significantly more time for, for clinical translation. Thank you very much.